Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Daniel here with another video. So today we are going to do something a little bit differently. We're going to consider a question. And that question is whether or not HMS Hood, the famous British battle cruiser from the Second World War, would have been preserved had she have survived her engagement with the Bismarck in May 1941. So the subject of whether or not HMS Hood would have been preserved as a museum ship had she survived the engagement with the Bismarck in the Denmark Strait on the 24th of May 1941 is a subject which I have previously covered in my book, HMS Hood, Pride of the Royal Navy, and it caused quite a few comments, mainly from those within the HMS Hood community and with particular ties to the HMS Hood Association. Um, because in my opinion, she would not have been preserved and that sort of theory or idea did not go down particularly well and um, caused a bit of a storm with certain individuals suggesting that she would have and saying basically how dare I write such a thing saying that such a ship that being the prey of Raleigh how she would not be uh, preserved but Honestly, I don't think she would have been, and I think if we look back at the Royal Navy at the time and what happened in the aftermath of the Second World War and sort of in the years following in the preservation of ships within sort of the years after the Second World War, I think we can say if, with a fair degree of certainty that she wouldn't have been preserved. So I think in the first instance, it's brief. It's worth briefly looking at some of the ships which have been preserved. Um, so there is a full list online. There's the uh, list of historic ships. Um, so just a few examples is, well, first of all, this HMS Trincomalee, which is currently at the National Royal Naval Museum at Hartlepool in the northeast. Um, so Trincomalee was a sailing vessel. She finished her service as a training ship and was placed in reserve in 1895 and she was sold for scrap two years later on the 19th of May 1897. So she was then purchased by an entrepreneur called George Cobb, restored and was renamed. So she was later used as an accommodation ship, a training vessel and as a holiday ship based in Falmouth and then Portsmouth and remained in active service until approximately 1986, after which she was restored and renamed Trincomalee in 1992. So at that point she was restored and given to the National Historic Fleet, renamed Trincomalee. She was from part of the National Royal Naval Museum. Um, she holds the distinction of being the oldest British warship afloat. Um, and that leads us on nicely to the next vessel, HMS Victory, which is 52 years older than the Trincomalee, but is in dry dock. So, in 1831, years following the Battle of Trafalgar, the Admiralty had issued orders for the Victory to be broken up. Um, within this, her timbers were to be used in other vessels. It was following a public outcry that... Um, it was felt that victory should sort of be given some sort of attention. So at the time, victory had been left largely forgotten, just moored alongside in Portsmouth. Um, so victory, rather than being disposed of, was instead designated as a tender to the Royal Navy. Um, she briefly returned to public years in July 1833, when then Princess Victoria who would later go on to be Queen Victoria, um, visited the ship and met with veterans of the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, so it was that visit which really generated interest in victory once more. Um, so she had a bit of a history thereafter where she 
sank, was refloated, restored, um, sort of continued to be maintained, but as a bit of a, a tender ship or sort of a bit of a training ship, the Admiralty didn't quite know what to do with her. So it was in 1921 that the Save Victory campaign was started um, by the public. And it was in January 1922 that the decision was taken because of the poor state of victory that she should be taken to dry dock. So it was whilst in dry dock that a number of proposals were put forward for victory. Somewhat to see her taken out of the water fully, moved to somewhere such as Trafalgar Square to act as a monument alongside Nelson's column. Um, others thought of creating something within the Portsmouth area. Um, or perhaps even adjacent to the Royal Naval College at Greenwich. Instead, the Royal Navy decided to keep her as sort of flagship of the Royal Navy. Um, and it would be a flag on which various sea lords would hold a flag. And it was just sort of during that time and helped pay for the maintenance of the ship that she was opened up to the public and continues to be opened up to the public today. So she was sort of a museum ship, which sort of was never intended to be a museum ship, but which graduated into that role. Um, yeah, so quite a few people point to victory, but I think pointing to victory is a bit of a funny one. Um, HMS Warrior similarly had a very checkered history. So Warrior was the first ironclad of the Royal Navy. Um, but by 1871, she began to be superseded um, when the Royal Navy commissioned its first vessel without masts. So, in 1904, Warrior was assigned to Portsmouth as part of HMS Vernon, the torpedo school, and was designated HMS Vernon III. Um, and that was in part to free up the name Warrior for a new armoured cruiser. Um, so basically the ship was stripped out, it was used for classroom training, the roof was, sorry, the deck was roofed over, um, the masts were tweaked, some were taken away and reinstalled, um, and then it was 1923 that the Royal Navy moved, uh, Vernon 3 to a shore based installation, at which point Warrior became somewhat redundant. Um, she resumed her name later that year, uh, and basically the Royal Navy looked to try and dispose of her. So, following the First World War, the Royal Navy, well, I say following the First World War, following the First World War and with the signing of the Washington Naval Treaty, there was a vast scrapping of ships, um, all told. 60 capital ships from the Royal Navy, the United States Navy, Japan, were all sent to the scrapyards, they were gone. Um, so with that and the disposal of other obsolete ships, there was a bit of a downturn in iron. Nevertheless, the Royal Navy said they didn't want to worry anymore, so they were going to get rid of it. But because of the downturn in the price of iron and steel, um, no one really wanted to take Warrior on because the scrap value wasn't there. So she remained sort of in situ uh, for a number of years. She was modified into a mooring jetty and to a Pembroke dock. She was then used as a floating oil jetty. Now she did see limited service in one function or another during the Second World War, but then in the aftermath of the war returned to her role as a floating oil jetty. So it was only in really the 60s that interest was gained in Warrior. Um, it had been discussed whether or not to rest. So it was only in really the 60s that interest was gained in Warrior. Um, it had been discussed whether or not to restore the ship. It never gained serious traction. But it was at the towards the end of the 60s that the London Council thought about taking Warrior, restoring her and using her as an attraction in London. 
Um, still, the Royal Navy want to keep her at Pembroke for use as an oil platform. So the scheme never got any traction. But then the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, intervened. He chaired a meeting which uh, looked at the restoration and preservation of Warrior. And from there, sort of the Maritime Trust was established and Warrior was thereafter taken off the hands of the Royal Navy, restored and became museum, the museum ship she is today. Now, some have also pointed to the World War I ship HMS Caroline. So Caroline was commissioned in December 1914, saw service with the Grand Fleet. Um, and then in 1922 was paid off at Devonport, placed into reserve and well, it was in 1924 that she was taken out of reserve and handed over to the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. Uh, within that, she was given to the Ulster Division and kept in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, so she stayed in that role until the outbreak of the Second World War when she became a headquarters ship for the Royal Navy in Belfast Harbour, but immediately after the war was handed back to the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. It was in that role that she continued until approximately 2009 when it was decided that she would be closed down. So following the closing of HMS Caroline and the moving of the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve to HMS Hibernia, the stone frigate, um, HMS Caroline was left to sort of sit there before finally being decommissioned in 2011. Now, no, no one quite knew what to do with Caroline following her decommissioning, but eventually it was decided to restore her to how she looked during the course of the First World War and to use her as a museum ship. So, again, Caroline is a bit of a dubious example and I think with Caroline, it was more of a conscious decision to preserve her because the very few ships from the First World War and from the Second World War have been preserved. So I think it was that sort of realisation which has contributed to Caroline being preserved. Had she been decommissioned in say the 50s or the 60s, in all likelihood she probably would have been scrapped. But I think a key ship which everyone points to is probably the most photographed, if not the most famous ship, museum ship in the United Kingdom is HMS Belfast. Now, and there will probably be a debate over whether or not Belfast is the most famous because of course there is HMS Victory, but she's probably one of the most iconic because she is situated in the heart of London on the River Thames by Tower Bridge. So, Belfast had obviously saw service during the Second World War, participated in the Arctic convoys, was present at the sinking of the Scharnhorst on the 26th of December 1943, and participated in the Normandy invasion, firing the first shots off Juno Beach. So, it was in 1963 that Belfast underwent a short refit to prepare for being paid off into the reserve, which occurred in December of that year. Now, she remained in reserve until January 1966, when parts of the ship and the power systems were reactivated. So between 1966 and 1970, she served as an accommodation ship, taking over those duties from HMS Sheffield. Um, so, moored in Farm Creek, the Imperial War Museum became interested in preserving a six inch gun turret. Now, Belfast famously had or has four six inch gun turrets uh, or triple turrets. Um, and what the Imperial War Museum wanted to do was to preserve a turret which it would represent a number of different classes of cruisers because obviously the town class, as Belfast was part of, wasn't the only um, cruiser class to use six-inch guns. Um, originally, the Belfast wasn't the ship that looked at. It was in 1967 that members from the museum looked at HMS Gambia 
a member of the colony class. So Gambia had already deteriorated by the 1960s. Um, so the Imperial War Museum, in conjunction with the National Maritime Museum, began to look elsewhere. Um, so those two institutions, along with the Ministry of Defence, um, decided to look at saving HMS Belfast because when they went and reviewed the ship to look at the turret, they realised that the ship itself wasn't in all that bad condition and that it was probably just as easy to preserve the entire ship as a memorial and it would be more fitting than to just take a single turret. Um, so a joint committee was formed with the Ministry of Defence and it was decreed that, yes, Belfast could be preserved. Um, however, the government intervened and in 1971 the government paymaster decided to um, basically not preserve the ship and that she would be reduced to disposal and scrapped. So in the aftermath of that decision, a number of discussions were had regarding the preservation of the ship and ultimately the Imperial War Museum and the National Maritime Museum with the Ministry of Defence won out and in July 1971 it was agreed that the, um, Operation Seahorse, as it was called, would be implemented and that Belfast could be saved. So Operation Seahorse was the movement of Belfast from Farm Creek to her current berth by the Tower of London, where she sits today. And she was famously opened up on Trafalgar Day, 1971. Um, for those that don't know, Trafalgar Day is the 21st of October. Um, so she was opened up to the public and she's moved a couple of times since for restoration work on one occasion down in Portsmouth, but she's remained in situ ever since. So, just from the brief overview, you can see that there's no sort of mantra or real thought process behind which ships to save and which ones to dispose of. And I think when considering whether or not the hood would have been preserved, it's worth looking at the ships which haven't been preserved. Um, so from the Second World War, there's a number of ships which you could argue should have been preserved and that it was probably criminal to dispose of. The first one and the prime candidate for preservation should probably be, have been HMS Warspite. So HMS Warspite was a battleship of the Queen Elizabeth class. She saw service during the First World War at the Battle of Jutland where she was damaged. Um, so serves during the Spanish Civil War as part of the um, neutrality patrols. And with the onset of the Second World War, she participated in a lot of convoy work and saw service in the Mediterranean where she scored the longest battleship, his, longest battleship hit in history against the Vittorio Benito. Um, I believe that was at the Battle of Cape Matapan in March 1941. Say she participated in a number of convoys and then she was damaged uh, off Italy by a German guided bomb, the Fritz X. And that knocked out her X turret, which was never brought back into operation because by this time, Mosby was an Asian ship. The side was patched up with concrete. She saw service of the Normandy beachhead providing gunfire support on Dede, operating off Sword Beach. Um, after that, she participated in sort of operations off Holland, off Walsh and Island, but then returned to Britain and never really did much else. So, following the end of the war, the Admiral got rid of war spite because the Royal Navy was massive, it was still the largest naval force, at least on paper, in the world. Um, but Britain could not afford to maintain the large Royal Navy. Um, notwithstanding the fact that, as I've mentioned, war spite was severely damaged and she was an aging ship. Um, so with war spite, brief proposals were or brief thought was given to proposals to 
preserve the ship, but ultimately in 1946 the Admiralty decided to dispose of her. Um, so she sailed from Spithead into Portsmouth where her guns were removed and in April 1947 she was taken from Portsmouth and it was anticipated that she would be scrapped at Balloyan up on the River Clyde. Um, whilst being towed she encountered a severe storm, broke free of her tugs and ran aground. Now, during successive efforts through 1947 into 1950s, um, she was gradually brought closer to the coast and then just scrapped in situ. Um, so I would say if any ship should have been preserved from the Second World War, it should have been war spade. I mean, the ship has I can't remember off the top of my head if it's 16 or 17 battle honours and the, ma the vast majority of those were gained during the Second World War. I mean, she is a ship with the most battle honours of any of the Royal Navy. Um, arguments could have been made to preserve HMS Rodney. So Rodney was one of the treaty battleships armed with 16 inch guns. She participated in the hunt for Sean Horst Eisenau in early 1941. Um, went to the rescue of the Chilean reefer, although the reefer was sunk before Rodney got there. She was instrumental in sinking the Bismarck on the 27th of May 1941. And her 16 inch guns pounded Bismarck into a massive twisted metal. She participated in Operation Torch, the invasion of French North Africa, Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, and then provided support for the invasion of Italy. In 1943, uh, she provided gunfire support off the Normandy beachhead in June and July 1944, and then turned to the whole fleet and was gradually placed into reserve. Um, so Rodney herself was scrapped in 1948. No attempts were made to preserve the ship, but the argument could be made that she should have been preserved. Then there's also the King George V class battleships, of which there was five. The HMS Prince of Wales was sunk in December 1941 by the Japanese, but it still left four of them. So there was a great discount Anson and Howe in this because by the time they were commissioned, nothing was really happening in the war. They participated in convoy duties and how famously went to the Far East and participated as part of the British Pacific Fleet. And Anson went and liberated Hong Kong at the end of the war. But would that qualify them for being museum ships? I wouldn't have said so, but that said, they could have been because, as we've seen with the likes of Caroline, you know, didn't have a particularly strong history but preserved nonetheless. Um, I would say if any of the King George V class battleships were to have been preserved it would have been either King George V or Duke of York which it would have made sense to do so. So Duke of York had participated in a number of convoy operations, she had famously been flagship of the home fleet. Um, like Rodney she participated in the sinking of the Bismarck on 27th of May 1941 she had also provided support, distant cover, um, to the invasion of Sicily in July 1943. And then went round to the Far East, seeing through the Suez Canal, to form part of the British Pacific Fleet. Um, King George V was the first and last British battleship to fire at mainland Japan. Oh, sorry, she was the only British battleship to fire her guns in anger at mainland Japan, and in doing so became the last British battleship to fire her guns in anger. Um, Duke of York, you know, when she was commissioned, she took Churchill across the Atlantic to meet Roosevelt in December 1941, following the attack on Pearl Harbor. She was flagship of the home fleet when she the flag of Bruce Fraser and went and sank the Sean Horst on the 26th of May 
19, sorry, 26th of December, 1943. And then in sort of June, July, 1945, arrived in the Far East and became flagship of the British Pacific Fleet, once more flying free SS flag. Um, so the King George V class battleships had their careers terminated in the early 1950s and they were mothballed and they were basically waterproofed and placed in the reserve. Um, they were the first British battleships to be preserved in such a fashion. Um, so they would have been fairly well preserved because obviously there would have been no moisture getting in and the whole idea of um, well, trying to preserve them when they were mothballed and placed in reserve was so that they could be reactivated if necessary. Um, ultimately, they were downgraded from reserve in the mid to late 1950s and then scrapped before the end of the decade. So, given that none of those were preserved, I would say it lends way to the argument that Hood wouldn't have been preserved. And it's worth also looking at HMS Vanguard, the last British battleship, um, which, which was launched in November 1944, commissioned too late to see any service in the Second World War. She was Britain's last battleship, never fired her guns in anger, took King, King George VI on a tour to the Mediterranean before he died. Um, participant participated in a number of NATO exercises, but then was ultimately scrapped by the beginning of the 60s. Um, I mean, when she was taken on the tour from Portsmouth to be scrapped, you know, the crowds cheered her. It turned out to watch the ship leave Portsmouth for the last time. There was even a film made of it, and a film made of her scrapping. But nothing was done to sort of preserve the ship, because why would the you know, hundreds of battleships before her that came and gone. So why would Vanguard be any different? And I think the same mantra can apply to the Hood. Yes, Hood was a pride of the Royal Navy. She was Britain's biggest warship ever until the commissioning of HMS Queen Elizabeth, the aircraft carrier, a couple of years ago. Um, but while she was the pinnacle of British sea power, other pinnacles had came and gone. You know, so in that regard, Hood wasn't special. I mean, there was the... It's been said that when there was a trouble spot or trouble broke out somewhere, the first call within the British Foreign Office was, where is the Hood? And that the Hood would be sent to wherever to conduct gunboat diplomacy. You know, that was famously seen during the Spanish Civil War of Bilbao or she helped to break the siege. But that was Britain flexing its military might. You know, that's what Britain had done for a couple of hundred years by that point. So in that regard, was that qualify Hood to have been a museum ship? No. You know, just because she was the biggest and she was the epitome of British sea power doesn't really qualify her for a special place when Preservation is concerned. Um, and by 1941, by the time she was sunk, she was in dire need of a refit. Um, her boilers needed a good overhaul, and apparently, you know, because she hadn't been taken in dry dock and her keel cleaned, she could only make around 28 knots. Given that she had a design speed of 32, that was quite sizable. Um, amount of work that would have needed to be done to get back to fighting efficiency. Um, so she was an aging ship and I think as well the hood if she had been preserved wouldn't have been the hood that everyone pictures. I mean plans were foot to refit the hood if she could be spared from service but ultimately she couldn't have been and had she have been refitted, she probably would have ended up looking something akin to the King George the Fifth class battleships. And she would have had a square or a rectangular um, tower and bridge compass platform. Um, 
uh, midship section may have been altered, some of the boats moved potentially to include an aircraft. Um, armour arrangement on deck would have been changed, it would have been given a little bit more armour and the aircraft armament would have been upgraded. Um, so she wouldn't have been the ship that everyone pictures up and has sort of that romantic image of. Um, and I think it's too easy to sort of when you picture the hood, picture the romantic image of a graceful, sleek battle cruiser lying off I don't know, in Australian port during the Empire Cruise. It is to think of the ship as a man of war. Um, I think part of the reason that people get sort of rosy eyed and view Hood with such enthusiasm and infection is because of the tragedy of the ship. Um, because if she had a crew of 1,418 and 1,415 of those were killed, you know, there was only three survivors. So I think. It's as much for what she did during her career as to, which combines with the manner of her loss, the tragedy of that, and the drama, which has led Hood to become the icon that she is today. I think had she have survived the Second World War, she would have been viewed with affection by some still, perhaps in the same vein that Victory is, or Belfast. But ultimately, I think she would likely have been scrapped because you know, she would have been expensive to maintain, along with the other capital ships of the Royal Navy. Um, and also at the time, preservation wasn't first and foremost in the Admiralty's mind. Um, because being expensive to maintain, you know, when you've got a cost cut, it's easier to get rid of the big ships than it is the smaller ones. Um, I think you've got a question of where would Hood have been sent had she been a museum ship. Um, I mean, you could say Portsmouth. I mean, I know the two aircraft carriers are docked in Portsmouth, but that would be a sizable chunk of anchorage to take up for a museum ship. Could she have been moored on the Thames? Potentially, but it would have been pretty expensive to meander her up the river. Um, I'm not sure where else really or realistically could have taken away she would have done or been done justice as a museum ship. So yeah, based on that, I don't think she would have I mean going back to what I said about the tragedy of the hood being part of the reason for her being so iconic, that was something that you know I was criticized for in my book on the hood but I think there is legitimacy in that if we look at say the example of the Titanic so you know the Titanic was trying to cross the Atlantic when she was sunk by the iceberg on a maiden voyage had she have succeeded in making it to New York that day perhaps got the blue riband in time whatever became the largest passenger liner for however long or Whatever. I think she too would have been scrapped. You know, I know you could argue, well, Queen Mary's been preserved, Kiwi too's been preserved, Queen Elizabeth's been preserved. I think it would have been hard to justify preserving Titanic. I mean, would she have worked as a hotel? I mean, White Star Line might have give consideration to that. I think the Cunard chips have sort of come out of the market at the moment, but I doubt whether realistically Titanic would have. I think with Titanic it's a case of what's so encapsulating about it is the tragedy again, because she was sunk on her maiden voyage with such a loss of life, whereas I think with Hood it is the tragedy of being 
famously sunk by Bismarck's Fifth Salvo, the tragedy of the loss of life. So yeah, I don't think that I don't think White Star would have gave Titanic up to be a hotel ship or a museum ship or anything. I think they would have just disposed of her, as they have done countless other vessels. Um, and just as Cunard has no doubt done with many other vessels. Um, I mean, if we look at, say, the Royal Caribbean fleet at present, the largest um, cruise ships in the world, will they be preserved? Likely not. Um, Queen Mary II, the last transatlantic liner, will she be preserved when she's decommissioned? She may be, in all likelihood. Well, it's too early to say. If I was a betting man, I would say no. But I think with the Titanic, it is the tragedy of being sunk on her first, or her maiden voyage, a huge loss of life. Um, obviously, the film Titanic has helped bring the tragedy to life to new audiences as well. Um, and I think that illustrates the appeal of the hood as well, because of the tragedy that surrounds her sinking, being sunk by Bismarck's fifth salvo. A huge loss of life, the cataclysmic explosion, um, which I think ties into the fact that she was sunk by the fifth salvo of the Bismarck. It was a cataclysmic explosion, it was a huge loss of life, and she was British, Britain's biggest warship. I think that is the perfect storm to sort of bring everything together to say that hood is iconic and why there's such an infatuation with her. Um, I think had she had a normal career like Renown, for example, then she too would have met the same fate as Renown and you know, Furious, King George V, Anson, Howe, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Warspite, you know, you name it. The, the various other town class cruisers, colony class cruisers, the hundreds of destroyers, she would have been decommissioned, scrapped. Perhaps one of her 50 inch guns might have been taken and would be in situ today outside the Imperial War Museum instead of a 50 inch gun from Rimmelies or Roberts. But um, that's another debate. But uh, yeah, I think it's realistic to say that the hood would not have been preserved. I think if you look at the manner in which their ships were disposed of and how the ships that have been preserved today have been preserved, then I think it is a, a fair bet to say that hood wouldn't have been. But um, they are just my thoughts. Um, Obviously, there's going to be people out there who have different views. You know, if your view is different, I'd like to hear from you. Drop a comment in the comment section below. Equally, if you agree, it'd be great to hear your thoughts also. Um, I really hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you did, it'd be great if you could hit a like. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any future updates. And we'll catch you next time. Thank you.